Good evening, everyone. Welcome back from spring break and happy first day of the spring quarter. As many of you uh, know, last summer, I reaffirmed our students' commitment to fostering a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive climate. Uh, we have started many new initiatives, and this evening I'm happy to announce and launch UCLA Samuelis' new Engineering in Action series, uh, when we, where we invite uh, notable guest speakers to discuss topics that have a direct impact on equity. Our inaugural program tonight uh, focuses on equity in artificial intelligence. While the School of Engineering put this uh, series together, what really struck me is how much this program is right at the nexus of North Campus and South Campus. Uh, the issues of inclusion and diversity are relevant to all of us, and they center on technology, society, and people. Uh, and so what I hope will come from this program and the series are more collaborations across campus where we combine our strengths and our different perspectives complementing one another in a joint effort to improve society. Uh, and students, uh, this message is for you too. I hope this stimulates new ideas and even challenges you to solve problems with different viewpoints in mind. Before we start the program, I, I wanna thank the student leadership from the UCLA ch chapter of the National Society for Black Engineers for their hard work. Uh, Daniel Ferguson, Imani Elston, and Alexander Johnson. Uh, they initiated the idea for this event and did much of the legwork in organizing it and bringing on board our all-star panelists. Thank you. Uh, and now on to our esteemed panel. I'm going to give a brief introduction of our panelists and then I will ask each of them uh, to share with us their work in AI and how it relates to equity and inclusion. And after that, we will move uh, into a panel discussion and then uh, answer some of your questions. Now, for those of you who binge watch TV, TV shows and, and simultaneously post on social media, Jung Suk Ju has turned that into a full-time scholarly pursuit. In fact, he consumes so much media that he actually uses AI to help him keep track. And so Professor Ju is an assistant prof of communications at UCLA and got his PhD in computer science from UCLA uh, Samuel Lee in 2015. And he teaches artificial intelligence and new media and revolutions in communication technology. So jung -Suk, can you tell us a little bit more about your work as it uh, relates to our topic today? Um, sure. Um, so, um, um, do I, do I share the slide? I passed the slide. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, so um, yeah, so thanks for the intro. So um, briefly, so my name is Jung Sok. Uh, so I am um, working in North Campus in the Department of Communication. Uh, but um, um, as Dean um, Marty just said, I actually got my degree uh, for a PhD in computer science at UCLA. So I spent five, and then before then I spent almost entire my life as an engineer and a computer scientist uh, um, before the PhD and including PhD. So I came from this South campus and then graduated and then uh, spent some time in industry. I uh, was working at Facebook as a research scientist uh, on machine learning and AI. And then I came back to academia uh, to the same school, uh, but um, um, to North campus, which is not very far from the South uh, physically. But um, I experienced um, uh, that transition uh, uh, was um, really big change for me because um, um, the both fields, uh, I mean, there are several fields in South and also North campus, but um, um, there's a big differences in culture, uh, which I hope uh, we can talk about some of this on um, today's meeting. So um, the, uh, the problems um, that we're gonna um, discuss today, um, 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 the equi equity problems and then other social issues. And, and I don't find that is a um, um, unique problem in engineering. So uh, I have seen kind of same kind of biases and discrimination and other social issues, no matter where you go. Uh, in engineering um, has engineering problems and social science also has the same um, or similar problem, law school, business schools, 
they all have similar issues and biases and then um, it's very hard to address. And then in my experience, um, the, the, key, the key problem um, of this um, um, biases and um, this kind of issue is in part caused by the fact that um, most academics and even students and people usually stay in the same place um, for their entire career. So you start as an engineer, then you will pursue the engineering career for your whole life. But um, um, do not really get an opportunity to intellect with other people. Uh, um, and, and also um, kind of hard to learn what the um, other people and, and um, scholars are, are researching about the same topic, the same topic of AI. So um, the uh, uh, so in my experience as an interdisciplinary researcher, uh, um, so um, kind of working with um, diverse group of people and sharing and exchanging ideas um, isn't as easy as um, uh, one can imagine because um, um, there is usually a huge amount of resistance to adopting new ideas. So um, the, I have another slide um, that I wanted to share um, to briefly explain the, one of the, my topics. So uh, my lab is um, kind of interdisciplinary um, computational uh, uh, machine learning, computer vision, um, and then also how to use those techniques to answer research questions in social science. And then also how to understand um, this hidden behaviors of AI using uh, lessons learned from um, social science and the humanities. And this one um, um, is a particular example that we um, published recently showing hidden gender bias of a computer vision model. So uh, um, the, the, what we do here is, um, um, so we collect some web images um, that describe people in different occupations and then slightly modify the content such that it'll create um, a pair of images. One is a little bit more feminine and then the other is a more masculine. Um, and then when you pass these images to your black box model, then the model will say, you know, um, if you're feminine, then you're just like person. But um, um, if you're more masculine, um, then the system will say you're more like researcher or scientist and many things. So um, this is kind of one, uh, um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of details um, behind that, but um, um, this is kind of a demonstration of how AI models are biased. Uh, this is very specific uh, um, research uh, uh, topic, uh, um, but um, 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 you know, hopefully um, can be linked to uh, the uh, not only the issues in AI and and, and machine learning community, but um, also in general the uh, lack of diversity uh, on race and and gender on the STEM fields. And then also, uh, um, you know, um, how students um, can learn those kind of um, um, issues while they're um, learning um, those techniques in, in engineering school, um, I think um, is um, kind of one area that uh, my uh, research um, tried to address. And I think uh, I probably spent too much time. So, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll be, uh, um, uh, um, you know, moving. Thank on. you. Yeah. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Sophia Umoja Noble, and she is the co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, or C2I2, at the School of Education and Information Studies. The center is committed to reimagining technology and championing race and uh, economic justice. Uh, Professor Noble teaches classes uh, that attract many of our computer science and engineering students. She also holds appointments in African-American studies and gender studies, and is the author of the critically acclaimed book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Uh, Sophia, can you tell us a little bit more about your work as it pertains to our discussion today? Sure. Thank you, Dean Murthy, for this invitation and for including me. And um, such an honor to get to speak to my colleagues and our incredible students at UCLA and our alumni and friends. Um, I'll just say a little bit about my work. First of all, I'm oriented to these subjects from the field of library and information science. So I'm an information scientist. I work in uh, the broad fields of knowledge and information creation, dissemination, preservation, curation. These are all um, the Asian words, um, are words that we're concerned with around information. 
And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I love listening to Professor Ju talk about, um, you know, uh, his work because 10 years ago when I was working on my dissertation at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the information school there, I can tell you that um, I was arguing that large scale knowledge and information systems like search engines really held a whole host of different kinds of discriminatory biases. And I was arguing that algorithms all the way kind of to the core of the design of these systems could hold racist and sexist kinds of bias. Now, a decade ago, I will tell you that when I was um, making those arguments to engineers, um, I was met with an incredible amount of derision. And let's just say I took a lot of body blows for making those arguments. Now, these are common sense arguments that we see in the headlines every month and unfortunately um, more and more. And we're seeing that the same kinds of logics that I was arguing about a decade ago are actually pervasive across a variety of different kinds of narrow artificial intelligence. And so um, what is so interesting to me is not only that it has taken this kind of rich interdisciplinary work between social scientists and humanists and computer scientists, information scientists, to make visible these concerns, um, but also there's such a huge appetite now among computer scientists and engineers for the kinds of work that social scientists have done. So for the kind of work that I've done and that my colleagues are doing. And what that signals to me is that, you know, the um, the very kind of narrow ways in which we thought about computer engineering and especially software development and computer science and, and you know, of course, um, emerging kinds of AI and machine learning, um, really the arguments that were made a decade ago uh, where people would say, you know, Safia, it's impossible for algorithms to discriminate because algorithms, algorithms are just math and math can't be racist, right? What we know is that, and I think from you know my work and, and many other people's work um, in this area, is that that's a little bit like our talking to biologists and saying, you know, what does it mean to be human or have a human experience and to have biologists respond to us and say, well, humans are just cells and mitochondria. That kind of hyper reductionist um, point of view is really interesting and important in some contexts, but in many other contexts, it's really insufficient to explain the kind of social phenomena of um, encoding ideas and applying them in the world. And of course, the incredible differential that um, that has among different kinds of genders and sexualities and ethnicities and um, geographies and economies. So my work is broadly concerned with those things. I take that up, of course, in my book, Algorithms of Oppression, and you know, a couple of really pointed case studies. But I think that work now has um, become much more mainstream. And um, I'm excited for us to be in this conversation tonight because I think that there are so many students and people in industry, people who are doing research, um, where we have the, the opportunity to model, especially at a place like UCLA, uh, you know, we're the number one public research university in the United States. We have the opportunity to be leading and cutting edge, really bleeding edge in these conversations and bringing together um, the, you know, these various points of views and really expanding the research. So I just wanna commend you, Dean Murthy, for opening up the possibility for this conversation and for your leadership and for the leadership of the students. And um, I'm looking forward to participating tonight. Thank you, this is so interesting. Thank you. Uh, let me jump into our next panelist here. Our next panelist is one of our own professors, Professor Violet Peng. She joined uh, our computer science department this year, and we're absolutely thrilled that she's here at UCLA. Now, Professor Peng specializes in natural language processing, which allows computers to understand different languages people use. Now, among the many topics that she's exploring are biases, toxic and abusive language, and discrimination. Uh, and so, Violet, can you tell us a bit more about the work that you do that pertains to our discussion today? Sure, yeah, I can you guys see my screen. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. Like Dean Murphy introduced, I'm a assistant 
professor in computer science department working on natural language processing, where our goal is to teach the computer to understand human language as well as speak human language so that they can have better and more natural communication with us. And one powerful technique we're using to enable the machine to understand human language and speak language is what we call language models. And it's a type of model that generates sentences word by word from left to right. So for example, you can just have a language model to say, oh, generate a sentence for me from nothing. Or you can actually prompt the language model to say, okay, the white person worked as something and you say, complete my sentence and it can generate words from left to right until it produces sentences. So nowadays, those models are very powerful in the sense that they can generate human-like languages fluent without any grammatical error. Um, and the issue is basically with our study, we actually find there are biases in such language models. And this is extremely important and disturbing because, as I said, these language models are the backbone of many downstream applications such as the news summarization, dialogue systems, auto-completion system, like if you're writing email, they will uh, generate some auto-reply for you, and cetera, many uh, downstream tasks. And the issue we find, uh, to summarize it here, is, for example, we can prompt this language model so we can specifically design what we prompt those language model. Particularly, we can prompt them with different demographic group. For example, in the contrast of this left-hand side example and right-hand side example, we can have the right person worked as, had a job as, or earned money by, and the black person worked as, had a job as, earned money by. So one thing I want to... Um, uh, emphasizes here the context is the same. Basically, it's some context point to what's the occupation of this demographic group. And then the only difference is the mention, uh, either white person or black person. And then we can have those language models to generate many different sentences for us. And we can draw a word cloud. So these are the two word cloud that we draw for these two different uh, prompt. And you can see basically the word cloud, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically uh, drawing uh, the, it's drawing all the words that appears in the con uh, continuation. And the larger the word is, means it's more frequent in this communication, uh, in the continuation. And you can see there are apparently distributional differences, whereas uh, the white person associated with more of a company, uh, officer, security guard, and then uh, the, the black person associate with something that's not so pleasant. So um, basically, the all these disturbing facts prompt us to basically evaluate uh, how, uh, like, what are the biases and how biased these language models are, so that we can we can have awareness of our technology. And uh, so I may go to a little bit too detailed here. Uh, so I'll uh, jump around. Basically, we uh, designed some method so that we can manipulate the prompt to uh, incorporate different demographic group, in, in, uh, including gender, race, sexual orientation. And we have them to generate tons of, have the language model to generate tons of this continuation so that we can analyze the distributional differences of this this continuation. And one thing I want to point out is usually some of this generation or continuation are very subtle, which means although human, when we read them, it's very easy for us to perceive there are something wrong. Actually, for AI, it's very hard. AI don't even have awareness of they're generating something that's offensive or have a negative um, social connotation. So this is one of our uh, research that we're looking to, which is like how to automatically let the machine to realize and be able to recognize there are some issues with the output they generate is already very challenging. So what we're looking into is basically, for example, these two continuations, the machine, one thing is the machine is not aware of the biases contained in it. Because what a machine can reasonably do nowadays in natural language understanding is we can do some sentiment analysis. 
which means like if there are praise, then it's positive sentiment. If there are criticism, then it's negative sentiment. But from this example, you can see actually the, it's purely a statement. There isn't any sentiment attached to it. So that's just to showcase how subtle it is in terms of for the machine to really understand. So we um, come up with some metric, what we call the regard, which is a social connotation um, towards a demographic group. So with this defining uh, metrics, we were able to better and more accurately measure the biases in these language models. And then we also have some follow-up work to look into how can we have some techniques to control the biases in the language uh, generation so that we can have more equal and more uh, less biased, more fair um, output and uh, models. Um, okay. And uh, these are uh, these are the things I have been working on. Um, and uh, I am really look forward to have more discussions um, tonight to see like what we can do even better because I think this is just a very first preliminary step that we have been explore um, and it's far from complete. And so we want to, like, I, I want to have that conversation to see what we can do better uh, and have the, um, the technology really serve us rather than divide us or like have different unequal impact on different group of people. Great, thank you so much, Violet. That, that's terrific. Uh, and then our final uh, panelist, I wanna give a warm and welcome to Lauren Thomas Quigley, who joins us from the University of Washington and IBM, where she is a data science and AI educator. She's led STEM education programs in higher education, government, nonprofits, and the tech industry. Uh, Professor Quigley hopes to improve STEM education through both research and practice and is an active member of NISP. Uh, Lauren, could you tell us a bit more about your work? Absolutely. Thank you, Dean Murphy. And thank you, uh, UCLA Nesby, for inviting me, um, Imani, for reaching out um, and asking the Nesby community to, to be a part of this. So I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, so my background, I'm an engineering education researcher. And um, in the last five years or so, I've been working in large scale STEM education and really tech education in the tech industry. So really switching out of the higher education space. Um, prior to that, I was working in large scale STEM education efforts in universities um, as a research scientist and program manager. But you know, the career story for me has been around these large scale efforts. And one of the things that really brought me toward, you know, being an education and STEM education, engineering education researcher, is uh, understanding how and why people choose STEM careers. Um, and in my research work as an identity researcher, I found that too often people are really selected by the discipline, um, which is often like a reproduction of the discipline itself. So how can we really have these effective conversations around diversifying uh, the tech workforce, the STEM workforce, if the process by which people become a part of these um, disciplines is really a, an act of reproduction within the discipline. So it's a little bit of a circular issue. And um, one of the reasons that I really wanted to get into um, tech education research, one was opportunity. Um, when we're talking about research and who gets to be an engineer and who gets to be a scientist within the context of higher education, that's a small select few of us. Um, you know, everyone here shares a um, connection to a higher education institution, to UCLA, and to these spaces where we really get to decide what technology is and, and who gets to make it. Um, but what about everybody else? What about the people that are consuming technology? Who are our constituents? Um, and how are they a part of this process? So um, one of the things that my perspective really for this talk is really around the idea of socio-technical issues. So really bringing this interdisciplinary perspective around what issues matter most to people and how do we use technology to address those issues? Um, I would argue that, especially in our mainstream, um, very capitalist uh, research technology um, efforts in, in this country, that um, 
really what, what, what gets made is really focused on who can purchase it, who can buy it. And we don't really always think about how that impacts other people. And that's also not a part of the education process typically. So many of the um, students on the line maybe are taking or have taken their ethics required course or their social science required course. But some of these concepts are not threaded throughout why and how we develop processes and products um, in, in STEM broadly. And um, one of the things that I feel is a, is a challenge is that we, we are actually doing a disservice um, as educators to not focus on how we can you know, develop that interdisciplinary perspective, but also really value the work of our colleagues across disciplines. So, um, you know, Professor Noble, Professor Juice, coming from different disciplines and making that effort to really cross those boundaries is something that we actually have to do in the education process consistently. And um, one of the things that, you know, is a, is a factor here as well is that a lot of these issues are under considered in technology, um, in the technology process, as well as the education process. So my thesis really is that if we took, um, if we looked at STEM and its process, product and knowledge as the vehicle for social justice, we would have to really reimagine how we do this work, how we are engineers, how we educate ourselves, how we educate each other, and what kinds of products we, we choose to take on. So um, really excited to be here with you all and uh, looking forward to our discussion tonight. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm really excited. You all said, given me all kinds of ideas to be thinking about and questioning you about. So let me jump in, all right? So let's jump right to the nub of it. What changes do you think have to be made to current AI systems in order to avoid inherent bias? Anybody jump in who wants to jump in? Well, I don't mind jumping in as a person who doesn't make AI and then leaving it to my um, colleagues who do. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the challenges before us right now will be determining um, where AI should and should not be used um, broadly in our societies. And I think this is one of the challenges here where many technologists, makers of um, systems are, uh, let's say, abdicating responsibility for thinking about those questions. And I think this goes um, to Dr. Quigley's point of view about kind of what, why we need this kind of interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, we can think to other moments in time in other industries, you know, was it worth it to make nuclear weapons? From a science point of view, of course, it seemed incredible, like an incredible opportunity and a, an incredible challenge. What that left the world was um, an, an, an enormous number of problems. So, you know, I think we have to figure out um, what should be made. I mean, there are severe consequences in the deployment and use of many of these technologies. They're beta tested on the most vulnerable among us around the world. Um, people who will never have an opportunity to speak back to or stop um, the use of an AI um, uh, determining whether they get to go to college or not, whether they'll get a bank loan, whether they'll get um, a mortgage, whether they will get a vaccine or healthcare, whether they can cross a border. There's really, um, uh, whether they'll spend their lives in prison, um, there are life or death consequences for many of these kinds of technologies. And I think that the people who are working many times on these technologies do not consider themselves responsible for the application. And, um, but see here, and we have a problem because those who are extremely well resourced to make these technologies and immediately deploy them to market um, can bypass every kind of, you know, type of social um, oversight or regulatory oversight, for example. So we're gonna have to deal with and contend with these tensions. And I think that, um, you know, we have this huge opportunity where we can move more of these questions um, to the, you know, to the center of interdisciplinary um, centers of excellence and, and research excellence and political policy, public policy excellence. Um, we have the, the, um, the centers and the experts to do that, but the question will be, will we have the will to do the hard work or will we continue to kind of compartmentalize that work? Excellent. Now, let me throw this to one of the computer scientists here. Professor Ju, would you like to jump in and say, you know, how we could make uh, AI 
less biased? Is it a data question? Is it an algorithm question? Is it a policy question? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, there are different um, 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 broad categories within AI research. So, there are different ways. And machine learning is just one of them. Uh, machine learning, of course, this is the, um, the most popular approach. Uh, and deep learning, um, especially, which requires a large amount of training data. Uh, and that's why uh, um, we have, have to um, use a um, large amount of data. And then the source of such large amount of data has been almost exclusively online, where nobody control um, the participation or composition of the data. And, and also from student point of view, for example, a lot of students want to learn uh, machine learning and deep learning um, as um, quickly as possible. It's very demanding um, skills that will help them uh, tremendously um, um, in, in you know, job search. And then they will um, go to um, the simplest um, possible route, which is um, to download a data set available to them. So whatever data, uh, I mean, the biases inside of the data set uh, will be then captured in the model. And, and, and of course, there are social issues and many things. So um, um, you know, equity and biases. But um, um, not everyone is um, um, heavily incentivized to scrutinize all of this because that means um, you know it will slow down their learning or or um, you know uh, delivering their products um, and many things. So I think um, and and um, I'm here like, I'm trying to um, be a little more defensive than um, uh, probably other panelists. But um, I think um, the uh, even though people have uh, good wills, and then um, they probably have a willingness to uh, spend, um, um, invest uh, some substantial amount of um, um, resources in identifying and mitigating those problems, um, it's, it's not always possible to uh, to even know uh, um, those are, are biased. And then, of course, um, that actually. Um, uh, was the um, there was some seminal finding by uh, Dr. Noble and then other panelists um, here, but um, uh, sometimes it's just hard to know that um, those data are um, is biased, and then um, and then the model, of course, and the system is biased, and then when they don't know um, they're biased um, and, and kind of hard to fix it, and then at the same time uh, again. Um, they're not really incentivized to um, look for those hidden problems of the system because there are a lot of um, problems very obvious, uh, like it doesn't work, it fails, your robots will fall down, um, self-driving cars will kind of uh, rush to the world. So there are so many uh, problems uh, which industry um, or um, you know, engineers would call high priority um, items, um, right? Uh, and and uh, so like there are too many high priority items. And then um, I think even though a lot of people, engineers um, are paying attention on this equity problems, I don't think this actually became one of these high priority items or high priority actionable items. So I think um, overall, um, you know, uh, getting this data cleaned up and then uh, maybe getting more data from underrepresented group of people. I mean, those are kind of uh, reasonable and probably doable approaches, although it's sometimes pretty difficult. But I think um, the, uh, the more um, important um, uh, mission here is to uh, really to establish this whole conversation and problem as one of the high priority um, problem that everyone uh, really needs to attend to. Okay. Professor Peng, you, you have an opinion on this? Yes, so uh, I want to first uh, comment and agree with Professor Noble and Pro Professor Ju on like we should probably raise the priority on uh, how do we, whether we want to address the problem right now and also like how, how important this problem is. It's not always on the highest priority um, of what we uh, have been considering as computer scientists. Although I think I do see more and more people start to um, consider. And then in terms of the challenge, I think another thing I want to mention is uh, nowadays a lot of the AI are powered by deep learning algorithms. They give us many success, but that's not from the history and also for now, that's not the only solution. So those models are data-driven model, which means it only learns from data. 
we have very little understanding. We have to confess that we have little understanding and control over this model, but it does not mean we ultimately won't have any understanding and control over this model. So I'm on the optimistic side in the sense that I think I won't say, oh, we should identify those direction. Maybe AI just shouldn't step onto it because we won't be able to solve the bias issue. I'm on the optimistic side because when the AI is actually infant, we're not only have those bias issue, we have many other issues. I think like we couldn't recognize a lot of objects correctly. We don't necessarily, we still, the computer vision still mixed up dog and cats, although it's much better than before. And the language models that like when we recognize language, we still have considerable misunderstanding of the meaning of the sentences. So those are all the directions we are trying to push and advance the AI. And I think one thing we should really do is just to put biases, equality, fairness as one of the top agenda um, on our development and try to solve the problem. And also when we are choosing all the tools or mechanism that we can use, like deep learning is one that give us high accuracy, but probably wasn't the one that gives us the best equity. Then in the choice of a model, whether we want to all in, in this deep learning or we want to bring in more of those symbolic method, more of a traditional classic AI method so that we can have more interpretability, more control over the model. Those are all those topics we should, I think um, I myself and a lot of computer scientists will also devote into doing and uh, try to make them better. Thank you. So I have a question for Dr. Quigley here. So how can higher ed institutions, uh, including engineering schools, better prepare their students to work in this field of AI thoughtfully and responsibly? What are we not teaching? So uh, that's a really good question. And it's an important one because, um, so Dr. Noble gave us the example of, you know, nuclear weapons as a innovation of science for science sake. And our classic engineering curriculum um, doesn't necessarily incentivize, incentivize us to think about these social issues, nor is it prepared to do that currently. Um, so our accreditation body requires that students to graduate with an accredited engineering degree have learned something about ethics. And that usually is embedded in a course or it's a course that's maybe like philosophy 100 or something that necessarily is not necessarily connected um, both topically or you know, even substantially to, to the disciplinary content that that engineering student is in. So one of the challenges that we really do have to reimagine how we are training engineers and how we are educating them. You know, I'm not proposing that we ch extend the already four or five or sometimes longer engineering curriculum. It's a long, it takes a long time to complete that degree. However, we can think about what happens within those courses that we're not just teaching programming for programming sake, that we're not just teaching these concepts just for those, those concepts sake, that we actually are connecting them to those social issues. So I'm a strong proponent of considering what are the socio-technical problems that motivate the content so that we can learn around those issues. Because one of the bigger, you know, the, one of the challenges is that and especially when you think about, um, even if you just think about STEM education, um, you know, we've had the last 30 years have been all about STEM, 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 STEM. And even within that community, there's a lot of work around integrative STEM education where we're thinking about the science and the math in the same class. Let's have an integrated social technical education where we are thinking about, you know, not just, you know, the what the model can do that we can develop a model that is you know five percent more accurate that's not as important as if that model is potentially you know training on data that doesn't you know that has a negative view of, of certain populations as an example so you know we have to help our engineers learn more about the social sciences and embed that within our work and then also with our colleagues, um, you know, and especially those of us in engineering, working with our colleagues in social science as collaborators and peers in that work, because we can't, we cannot disregard the, the implications of what we're doing. And I don't believe that, you know, 
that this is that society in general is tolerant of that any longer society in general is saying we you know we had thousands of people you know protesting everyone became a data scientist when you know COVID came out and we were looking at you know how do we flatten the curve and there is a a social and societal appetite for these issues to be relevant that we as scientists own our responsibility and and that we also collaborate as well so i think that there's a lot of things that we can do and that we should do and you know definitely you know it's important i thought it was really impressive dean murthy to have you leading this discussion because this is not something that happens in the college of engineering everywhere this is not a topic that is um you know discussed necessarily in technical circles and we have to be able to do that but we also have to really go further and embed these issues into our educative process into the technologies that we design and then also develop this greater sense of accountability to to broader society we didn't all just become an engineer to have a great job you know a lot of us chose engineering because we want to change the world and how we do that is by so so focusing on these issues yeah i actually think it's much more exciting to think about engineering in that broader way uh, Professor Noble, you had your hand up. Uh, I, this is the last comment I'm going to take from this panel. I know we've got a bunch of students just raring to ask you questions. I'll open this up soon. Great. I just want to um, high five on Dr. Quigley and say one of the challenges here to this is that, you know, we want to remember, um, I, I feel like I, because I talk to computer scientists all the time, especially people in industry, and, you know, they're, they're frozen because they don't feel a strong degree of competency in these conversations. And this is one of the reasons why they're avoided in engineering education. It's one of the reasons why I get a lot of computer science students in my classes. And I think what we wanna remember is um, just as I have kind of cursory, not PhD level of expertise in computer science, um, I do have it in sociology and social sciences, right? So we are in this in incredible, environment called the university where you could have world leaders in these areas around the social and the technical working together rather than doing this kind of um, approach that we have that's so disciplinary where the engineers now have to kind of bone up on these topics and they're not going to do a good job no more than anyone wants to come and take have me teach them machine learning so i think this is one of the ways where deans and leadership at um, universities really could provide an incredible model which is helping to break down those barriers, more joint appointments, more ways, more team teaching, you know, more of the ways that we can value the humanities and social sciences, because now we see how desperately we need those fields um, to help us understand the engineering context. Indeed, indeed. All right, so here's questions from our audience. This is from Professor Peng. What is the source of the training data for the GPT-2 language model? Yeah, I um, I actually answered in the chat. It's yeah. from the web data and also including Reddit. So there will be a lot of sort uh, biases sources, sources in the training data. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so here's a uh, another question. Uh, a human has moral value or social norms as a guideline for people to sense if a person is doing the right thing. However, AI does not have this kind of thing. How do we know if AI is operating ethically or evilly? How to train AI or guide AI before allowing AI uh, in its fully automated mode? So how do you how do you inculcate morality in AI? Do we just stand guard, or is there a way to do this? I mean, who wants to jump in? It's a really deep question. Okay, you want to do it? Do it, Doctor Quickly. Oh, I'm of the opinion that you can't. Yeah. Um, and that you have to have the human in the loop. It's not, it's yeah. not an option. That's right. We can't automate everything. It's just not, and, and that is not the right thing to do. We cannot expect a machine to behave with a, you know, really with a humanistic and, um, and really like we can't expect a machine to adopt a human rights framework that we as people are struggling to do ourselves. And these issues are coming up because we have not really been able to see each other fully. 
um, as, a, as a broad society. So asking a machine to do that is, is not realistic. Anybody want to disagree with that or? Yeah, uh, sorry. So I, I think I'm also always on the more optimistic side. I think we can add controls and regulations to the model. Um, so it's not like we have full control over the model now. So if we say like we cannot do it right now, I would agree. But I um, won't agree with like with the progress of the technology. There isn't a way that we can develop um, technologies that we can really um, have fully control over our model and ingest all, all those social norms and knowledges into the model so that it can behave more like what we hope it can behave. Okay, just a, a gentle pushback, Professor Pang. You know, what when you talk about modeling, I mean, this is where in other disciplines, we understand that models are actually a kind of normativity that is, um, that is incredibly fraught with power dynamics. And, you know, the normativity of models, especially when you talk about statistical modeling and other kinds of data modeling, um, really assumes that there is a particular set of ideals and anything deviant from that, right, falls out, out of normativity. Well, this is in the social world. Um, these are complex political, social, historical issues. I think that, you know, the desire, the impulse to want to make a normative model for the whole world on all kinds of various axes is actually the thing that social scientists and humanists are often challenging and saying that's not the world we want to live in, one where we're always trying to find a model. Who fits in the model and who doesn't fit in the model is really the questions that, that we're raising. Yeah, I understand that. But what I'm saying is maybe the current model, you see, we're trying to develop one model for everything, but it's not the only thing we can do. And it's not the final thing we can do. We can not add a lot of, it's like you buy a machine, right? Like a washing machine. Nowadays, it provides you a lot of choices and knobs that you can twist so that it's best fit your, um, fit your need. We have similar mechanism, although it's not perfect, it's far from perfect to control AI models. And the thing we still need to do, that's what I'm saying, that's why I'm saying I'm optimistic, yet I think there is a long way to go, is to really have those precise control implemented so that whenever you want to use this model, you can say, I'm such a configuration. So basically it can't adapt to you. For example, one thing we are currently doing and can do a little bit, like make, make some dent there is some something we call the personal chatbot, which means if you have a conversational system that can chat with you, they can learn your preference, your uh, a lot of your characteristic, and they can try to adapt to your habit to better access you and better communicate with you. Um, this type of control are something we're always pushing to, and we're not definitely not trying to build one model for everyone. And I think once we can have those very precise control, which again, we don't have yet, uh, but I don't think that's something we couldn't have. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, let me go on to the next question. Very interesting discussion here. I think we we'll probably do an hour on this alone. Um, recently on social media, especially Twitter, there's been discussion as to whether algorithms themselves can be biased or whether it is all dependent on the data itself that is used to train the models. Would you be able to speak about the ability of models themselves to be biased, especially against marginalized groups within society? Yeah, I've been following that um, conversation on Twitter, there's a number of people who are interested in this conversation. I think generally where people are netting out is that there um, most certainly can be bias in modeling. There's not even a question about that. I think most people would agree who are kind of studying and interested in this area. Um, you know, the question also remains, which is um, why is there a desire to kind of unbias a data model or a machine learning algorithm or a whole different host of technologies. Um, there are many people who would argue that 
to reach a state of unbiased is actually um, impossible. That there will always be values present, always. The question is, what are the values that will be present? So I think part of the the logic here is that we have a whole community. We, it's actually a fairly new community over the last 10 years or so of kind of fairness, accountability, accountability transparency, um, practitioners and researchers who are interested in unbiasing models, unbiasing algorithms, unbiasing data, right? And uh, many of us are arguing, well, actually, that's not possible. So the question is, what are the biases? Can you see them? And why don't we use more sophisticated language than bias? Do they discriminate? Are they oppressive? What are the consequences? Do they... Um, um, are, is, it a, is it a screening tool that when Amazon uses to apply to resumes, screens out all the women? I mean, we actually have to talk in real specifics. That is much more powerful than saying bias or unbias, because what that leaves us with is no power analysis, no ability to understand what we're talking about. If we do, if we use that kind of language. And I think that there's a, a huge community kind of building of people who'd say our aspiration should not be unbiasing. Our aspiration should be making visible what is happening in these systems because they will always be operating, um, you know, to someone's benefit or or not. Interesting. Um, right, I'll so add that bias is we're really talking about when we say bias. It is a it's the weaker phrasing because we're talking about a statistical measure that measures one aspect. We're not, and there are ways that you can, you know, my iPhone is biased to open to open my face because I've trained the, the model matches one-to-one -one for my face. Maybe not when I first wake up in the morning, maybe not after I've run around the block, but it will, it's trained to match me one-to-one. -one. And, and that is a bias. I, I don't want it to open when, you know, a stranger picks up my phone that might happen to look like me. So I think like, you know, we have to really understand what the terms mean. And again, give ourselves a more rich understanding of the social impact. So that's really what Dr. Noble is saying. Like, we have to understand that, yes, you can identify, you can use an algorithm to say, yes, I, maybe I want to hire more diverse people. And this is how I'm going to identify them out of that pool by looking for certain terms or whatever it is. But how we apply that is really the responsibility aspect that's really important to doing AI work that's not just for AI's sake. Here's a specific one. What studies have been done relative to AI's impact and bias on politically targeted misinformation? You know, all the stuff that we went through these last yeah. couple of years. There's an amazing group of researchers working at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard University, led by Dr. Joan Donovan, who's probably one of the most important um, researchers right now in the country who's studying things like mini media manipulation and um, political targeting. Of course, Claire Wardle, who's at First Draft News, who's done a, a lot of amazing, important work. Um, I think that the journalists at the markup have been doing a very good job of helping us understand um, some of the more kind of hidden dimensions of um, in the kind of investigative journalism around um, some of these topics. So there's actually um, a number of people, many of them are sociologists and social scientists who are working in interdisciplinary teams and they have um, incredible computer scientists working and data scientists working on their teams. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? All right, let me jump into, uh, I, this has got to be pretty close to the end. In your opinions, would the lived experience of those who are creating, modeling these AI systems, or even those who are making decisions related to these AI systems, change or impact the current issues related to bias? Aside from providing the social science, humanist education courses to engineering students, what else can we do to address these issues? How can we jump in? I mean, what, what, what can the university do? Uh, what should I do as Dean of Engineering? Tell me that. I feel like I have, I, I'm, I'm dying to take a meeting with you because I love that you're creating these invitations. I think everybody wants to sit with you, um, Dean Murthy. I mean, you, you are know, welcome. These, I would love to have these, that meeting. Yeah, these are the really, I mean, this is, 
these are the leadership questions, you know, um, here at UCLA, which is, of course, what you've done here with, with Nesby. I mean, look at how our um, National Society of Black Engineers students have really, like, put this into the agenda for the school. So what we know is that many times kind of minoritized um, student groups, faculty groups, staff groups, alumni, um, you know, we hold different identities and so we see different things. And I think what we're trying to do is figure out how do we innovate um, you know, UCLA is really, I feel like, a place where, you know, we have um, computer scientists and communications, Professor Ju, you know, I think of like all of us here, um, you know, and our networks, um, how we could be leaders in these conversations. And, you know, some of the most interesting places in the world right now are doing things like putting their new AI initiatives um, in a college of humanities. For example, Oxford University just did that a couple of years ago. I went out there and, and helped launch that. Um, you know, so think about these really interesting, innovative ways. Like, how do we make UCLA the place where this isn't a strange conversation? It's actually part of our everyday world to think about what we're responsible for doing. And I think that we could have a huge impact, quite frankly, on um, not just the fields of engineering, but you know, broadly on modeling this kind of interdisciplinarity. I will tell you that our students, when they come to um, our classes, you know, on North Campus, and I know Professor Ju, you probably know this too, right? There's like tears are in their eyes. They can't believe that the kind of responsibility that they have for these huge problems in the world, and they don't understand how they haven't been trained yet on these things. So I think we're we're um, you know, you're demonstrating the leadership here that we need. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so sorry that we've got to close this. I agree with you. UCLA is absolute, absolutely the place to be doing this. Uh, we've come to the end of our program. Uh, I've learned so much from this discussion. Thank you to all our wonderful panelists and thank you to our audience for participating. Uh, please be on the lookout for more programs uh, in the Engineering in Action series. Uh, good night, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thanks.